All right, chapter 10. Praise God, let's go for it. Colliding with destiny. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. The steps of a good man are, you can all say it with me, ordered of the Lord. It's one of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 37, 23. These verses seem to indicate that there's very little that happens by mere chance in life of one whose heart and will are surrendered to God. The Lord has appointments for us to keep. They are divine appointments. You know, when you think about um, in the course of a day, how many appointments you have, um, whether it's to meet with people, a doctor's appointment, a coffee appointment, um, you've got to go to the bank, appointment, 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 all these schedules that you hate to break. The most important appointment that you have for any day is those divine appointments, because those divine appointments will change your life for the better. Even if you have to miss one of those standard appointments, um, and I'm not talking about breaking your word with people. Well, you know, I'm sorry, God told me not to come today. Or I'm not, sometimes Christians get really flaky and wacky with this kind of stuff. I'm talking about, um, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'm talking about the example you've heard us talk about before. When Mallory came to Destiny, Amy had to go to Costco that day. She had an appointment, an appointed time. She has six children, a busy schedule, and God told her to go right then. She could have waited and been like, why do I need to go right now? What's happening? She obeyed God, and because of her obedience, she discovered Mallory, and the rest is history. Some of you have heard that story um, before, but that's a divine appointment. She could have, and you know what? That's not God. He knows I've got six kids. It's busy. Um, I got a long way to drive, but no, she heard the voice of God, and she obeyed. Perhaps the most effective soul winning happens when we collide with destiny. That's a prime example right where. Some of the greatest soul winners are not necessarily those in full-time ministry, but those who are able to perceive when they've walked into the midst of God-ordained rendezvous with another individual. If you ask him to set you up with a God-ordained rendezvous, a rendezvous is a date, you will. You will have those divine appointments. You, you, you almost I can almost hear some of your minds buzzing and like, um, you know, like, is that God? And, and yes, it probably was God setting you up with that person to speak to, to pray with, to encourage, to buy their coffee, to whatever the situation may be, those are divine appointments. Sometimes a divine appointment is, let's say you are early, um, like tonight. I thought I thought it was early. Our power went out. It clock, knocked our clocks out for 30 minutes. So I thought, oh, great, I'm early. Well, really, I was on time because my clock was messed up. But let's say I really was early for once. In that 30 minutes, what happens if Laura says, turn left, go into the coffee shop and buy this woman with the blue shirt a cup of coffee? That's a divine appointment right there. God's, God's wanting to set his people up for those divine opportunities. Come on. In this lesson, we'll take a look at two divine appointments recorded for us in the word of God. In doing so, we may be better equipped to discern we are in the midst of a divine appointment and what to do when we arrive. Our hope is that the Lord would open our eyes to these daily assignments that he has prepared for us and that we would know how to make the most of them. I'm not going to read the whole example. You're very familiar. Most of you are. If you're not, please read this. It is it's a lot um, of scripture. John, John chapter 4, verse 3 to, th uh, to 38. Uh, That's the Samaritan woman at the well where Jesus uh, meets with the woman there and uh, asks water. Uh, ask for her to, and the, to give and the him some sum water. of it is is you know back then you know they didn't speak to each other culturally they didn't speak to each other and then also men and women didn't speak to each other so but I want to I want to say something here based on what we're talking about because one of the things is that Jesus is in an outdoor area um his some of his disciples had left obviously whoever wrote this was with him because his disciples left him. Somebody would, would have been there to witness what took place, to be able to write this down. Jesus didn't meet with his disciples and make up a story and say, hey, you'll never guess what happened when I was at the well earlier. I was with this woman. So uh, somebody was with him there, number one. He wasn't alone. Uh, somebody was there at the well, but, but he was there. His disciples had left. And um, he was in a public place. Jesus wasn't meeting privately in some closed quarters behind. Correct. Yes. So in other words, you know, I mean, he was above reproach. He was uh, he was avoiding the appearance of evil. Correct. So. Correct. But we know the whole story and her having to give him a drink and then him letting her know that he was the living water. That was a divine appointment. 
Um, part of our divine appointments is recognizing the Holy Spirit's direction. Learn to recognize the prompting of the Holy Spirit and be willing to adjust your plans. That was, again, a prime example of, of Amy and Mallory. You know, I've had, I've really struggled with that. I have so many things on my plate. I am very schedule oriented. I do not like to mess up my schedule because if one thing falls behind, then something falls behind. And then it's just a domino effect. So I struggle with this on a, on a personal level. And I've really had to say, uh, Lord, please help me. Help me to know not to be in such a rush that I miss that still small voice and that guiding of your spirit to say, wait, or stop, or don't do that, or go here instead, or text so-and-so, or, do, you know, I've had that happen before where, you know, in the middle, I'll, I'll text somebody, or I think I text them in my head, and I, I might be doing something, maybe I'm in the shower or something, and then I get out and I forget, and sure enough, that person will text me and say, I'm really having a hard day, and that was the prompting of the Holy Spirit for me to reach out to them. So learning to not be so busy that you're too busy to hear his voice. You know, you're, you're too busy to stop in the moment and, you know, smell the roses. I remember an example uh, when Israel, about almost four years ago, we had this uh, par portion in our neighborhood, this person's house. They have these gorgeous flowers that just shoot up um, right by their mailbox. And little Israel, believe it or not, he was sort of little at one time, would walk by and every single time, every single time he would bend down and smell the flowers. You know, how many of us take time to, you know, that phrase, smell the roses. He would do it every time. It didn't matter what we were doing. And we would just chuckle to ourselves because little Israel always stopped and bent down. And we got a picture of him one day in his little Spider-Man costume and little Spider-Man bending down and smelling the flowers. In those moments, in that quiet, in that place is the exact place that the Lord can speak to you to do something different outside of your norm, outside of your schedule. Um, this account of what we commonly refer to as the woman of the well, which I encourage you to read through on your own time, gives us an up close look at one familiar, most familiar divine appointment mentioned in scripture. There are several elements that will be helpful for us to look at it more closely. Jesus left Judea and departed into Galilee and he needed to go through Samaria. So he had a different way he could have gone, but he didn't. Why was the detail of this second sentence included? So if you look at the map, you'll see he could have gone a different route and he didn't. Learn to recognize opportunities in which conversations can be turned Godward. A woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is that you being a Jew ask a drink for me, a Samaritan woman? It's amazing at how many situations arise which the door is open wide to turn a person's heart towards God. He immediately flipped that around into, if you look above, he said, Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sometimes it's just a matter of baiting the hook to see if the person bites. In other words, I can test the waters of a person's heart and look to see if there's any interest in pursuing a conversation. Okay, a lot of times you can... You can see where a person is. He, he baited her in that moment. He used the, the spirit of God within him. He was God, but he was human in flesh form to follow that lead. You will be amazed to see how many people respond to just a few spirit-led statements, okay? Following the leading of his voice. The Bible says, you are his sheep and you hear his voice and the voice of a stranger you shall not hear. And we've talked about this before. We read the word of God, not because if I don't read my Bible, I'm going to get a flat tire or my kid's going to get sick. I read the word of God so that I'm equipped with the word of God. And in the hard times, in the tough place, and in these divine places, that's what's going to come out of me. I'm equipped with what his word says. Then I also know, you know, I had a really good story. Um, I was reading that identity book that I gave all of our uh, Project Leon Group uh, Brother Dale was teaching on identity, and I found a pocketbook that taught on identity. And he gave the example of a, a man who was sincere about his walk with God, but he was sincerely wrong. And what had happened was he was describing to the author of this book how every time he went to do something, he would become almost like paralyzed and like he, he couldn't move his body and whatnot. And so the guy began to deconstruct some things and, um, you know, was asking him questions like, what's your daily walk with the Lord like? And he shared with him some things and he said, well, you know, I, I follow the leading of God's voice. If, if, um, when God tells me to go to lunch and I think of Burger King, uh, then God wants me to go to Burger King. So then I go to Burger King. And if I think of a Whopper, God wants me to have a Whopper. 
And that's how this man was proceeding to um, think of that's how God was leading him. So then um, he said to him, what about your church attendance? What are you doing on Sundays? Well, you know, I just go where the Lord leads me. And God's been leading me to a Mormon church. And I've been to the Mormon church the last five Sundays. So there, the author in this book found the error of this man's ways and how he was deeply wrong, sincerely wrong, because he wasn't rooted in the word, the full gospel of Christ, of Jesus Christ, not the Latter-day Saints, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible that we read. So the more you read and you feast on God's word, the less you'll be deceived. Even Satan knew the word of God. He said to Jesus, can you turn these stones into bread? And then Jesus right away answered him. You can, you can, uh, if you jump off of this, you know, what will happen? You know, you'll, you'll have this, the angels will catch you. And, and Jesus knew how to answer him. So it's important that we equip ourselves with the word of God. I just really felt important to mention that if you're struggling with hearing the voice of God and well, how do I know if it's me? And well, you know what? The, the devil is not going to lead you to witness to somebody. The devil is not going to lead you to pray for somebody. Okay. Amen. I wanted to say I love the fact that the title of this chapter is, uh, you know, uh, colliding with destiny and and understanding divine moments um, that God. Remember, you know, the Bible says um, in in the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, you know, that uh, just afterwards says that we've been saved by grace. Uh, uh, we have been saved by grace through faith, for it is the gift of God. Um, and then it continues to talk about you know, we've been created in, in uh, Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand. I believe the works that God has prepared for us beforehand are the divine moments that we get to encounter in life. And so if you have to think about it, that God has set you up um, and you become, if you just, uh, well, you know, the, the book of Psalms and Proverbs, a lot will say Selah. Pause and think about this. If you'll stop and seal and pause and think about this, that God has set up divine moments for you. Um, I love what Dr. Leon says here when she was reading that last, that put the bait on the hook. In other words, all you're doing is you're baiting the possibility of a divine moment. Um, because if God has a divine moment set up for you and you put the bait of, on the hook, Putting the bait on the hook is like some of the examples here. You're out at a bus stop and somebody's eating what looks like a delicious hot dog and you want to uh, kind of open up the door, put the bait on the hook. Well, how do you do that? Somebody that's kind of a little bit smart will do something as simple as, wow, I wonder if there's going to be hot dogs in heaven. You know, think of a creative way and then wait for the response. It can even and be like it, connecting with someone. Exactly. But but what you're doing is you're baiting the person. But like, let's or say not in, a, not in a bad way, in a good way. That of you've course. got like golf clubs. Right. And I could say, hey, do you golf? Oh, yeah, me too. I'm engaged. I'm engaged in a conversation. Or, hey, I noticed that you, um, you know, you have five kids. You know, I have, I have six, you know. It's, it's a way to connect with people. You can use those kind of connectors um, just to get people's, you know, attention. Yeah, no, I, that's As, you know, that's great. I was talking more on spiritual, yes, on know, a spiritual state to test because sometimes you're not going to have when when you're in a in a quick moment, you're not going to have the time. It's going to be one of those spirit, you know, spontaneous, quick, yeah, just to test the spiritual temperature, putting bait on the hook. Praise God. Now we're going to go through this next part here really quickly. I wanted to say, um, you know, this part with using God's gifts in the marketplace. Um, I want you to read through this, but this is so crucial. Um, I was listening to a Jane Hammond reel, and I had said to Pastor Mark, I said, you know, I've said that before. I just didn't realize what scripture it was in. And she talked about how God equips you for every season of life that you're in. So no matter what you're doing, he's equipped you to be everything that, that he's called you to be. So whether you are a school teacher, whether you are a dentist, a chef, a nurse, a stay-at-home mom, whether you are a wife, whether you are a business person, electrician, whatever the case may be, you work in an office, he has equipped you for that task. He has divinely equipped you for that task. And for too long, the church has kept Jesus in a box, Jesus in the four walls, where the, the part that we're trying to encourage you and engage with you tonight is to say, we're here to equip you Come to on. go into the marketplace no matter where you're at and to preach, teach, and demonstrate. That is what our calling well, is. I wanted to say, you know, uh, the powerful thing, and I want to I want to kind of, you know, give everybody a pat on the shoulder because 
are kind of um, in a sense in the in the right form of saying, I'm very proud of, and not proud within the wrong definition of proud, I'm blessed rather, to see that we are a culture in our church that we really uh, we really are open to the gifts of God, and especially in the marketplace, even through our outreach and our evangelism, we function in the gifts. And obviously to yes. continue with this lady, the Samaritan woman right here, and then we'll move on with this point is that, you know, Jesus was with her and he said, well, you know, she said, well, I have no husband. And he said, well, truly you are, you're right. Truly, you, it, it, that's right that you say you have no husband. You've had five, and the one with you're with right now is not your husband. She said, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. And so that is uh, using the gifts of God in the marketplace, um, in those divine, you know, when you're using, I, I, I see those divine moments um, that God gives us, those divine moments when they're coupled with those gifts. It's definitely for me, a really um, a clear uh, indication you're in the middle of a divine moment right there where God begins to give you a gift, uh, uh, get to operate in a gift that's going to apply, whether it's prophetic, whether it's a word of knowledge, however it is, whether it's a prophecy, whatever. When you begin to release that, you're in a divine moment because God is now putting you in something. Remember, He prepared you for those good works beforehand. Praise God. Well, and and I, so you had mentioned this before, but he Jesus was criticized for speaking to her. But if you look at the bottom paragraph, it says, please know that Jesus was in open in a public setting as he spoke to the Samaritan woman. He was not alone with her. Um, the Bible says abstain from the appearances of evil. So there's it's one thing to minister to a drug addict. It's a difference than to shoot up with them. It's one thing to minister in Debar. It's another thing to sit there and drink shots with the person. Be careful to know the difference. In such circumstances, do not fall prey to the enemy's attempt to steal, kill, and destroy your testimony. So Jesus went into those dark places, but he wasn't getting drunk. He wasn't doing the things um, that they were doing, but he wasn't afraid to go into those places. He wasn't afraid to go in and um, just hang out and be real with them. I want to I want to say this here before we get to a man, no money, but a miracle, because um, I'm just going to cover up all of those paragraphs in, in this uh, where it says at the bottom of page 81, reaching an individual could lead to reaching a multitude. I want to yes. go ahead and say this. Um, both are important. Jesus was comfortable ministering to the multitudes, and he was com comfortable in so many scriptures to reach out to the individual. Um, and, and and one doesn't carry greater reward than the other because these are all acts of obedience according to the call and gift that God has called individuals to. So just because one is reaching multitudes and one is reaching individuals, and, and the one that runs multitudes cannot be too arrogant to say that I'm too good to go and minister to an individual. And the one who is mostly ministering to individuals must not operate in fear if God tells them to speak and maybe there's a greater audience of 20 or 30 people for them, they've got to be bold as a lion. The righteous are as bold as a lion. The point of the matter is, is that we must not fear um, and winning the individual and the multitudes is just as important. And I'm going to go ahead one step further. Not always the case, but I would actually venture to say probably more than 50 percent of the time. Sometimes when we are ministering to the individual that um, and th that individual ends up, you don't know who you're preaching to or who you're witnessing to or who you're ministering. You don't know who you're in a divine moment with because that person can become the next Billy Graham. That's right. Can become the next Smith Wigglesworth. Can become, you know, and, and oftentimes you will find with these big preachers, um, they will tell you the story about one day they were in the park and some guy came and told them about the love of Jesus. God came and completely wrecked their world in the best way possible. And now they're this massive minister. And I'm going to give you one, one more example just to let you know. There was a man of God. I don't know what his name was. This is a historical fact. Out in um, Zephyr Hills in, in Florida, uh, God told him to, to have a crusade. And he put a tent out, filled it up with chairs, and was going to be preaching for a week. And um, nobody showed up in his meetings, not a single person except for one night. <laughs> and uh, he preached his guts out, gave an altar call, and that one person got saved. 
Somebody said, well, that was a flop of an evangelical event. Well, that one person was Billy Graham. Yes. Hallelujah. So, so listen, let me tell you right now, that is an amazing thing. So we've, we've got to be open to the individual and to the masses and to the multitudes. Amen. Praise God. Both are important in the eyes of God. Jesus demonstrated that he wasn't too proud or arrogant to minister to, to one. You know, I'm Jesus. I don't want to preach to one. Don't you know who I am? I'm the son of God. Anyway, let's go move on. Um, the next portion is talking about basically people begging for money on streets. Um, ask the Lord for divine appointments. You know, you can discern whether or not it's going to be someone that, you know, you should give your money to. If you look down at the bottom paragraph, it says, Most of us have been approached at one time or another by someone begging for money as we walked on the street. When was the last time you said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. I don't imagine many of us have. Why not? Because most of us picture ourselves taking the person by right hand, as Peter did, and seeing that person just flop over like a fish on a boating dock. We don't have the slightest expectation that God will heal them. Even if we did, we would be too afraid that he would not, for one reason or another, that we would end up looking like fools. So what in the world caused Peter to make a, such an extreme radical statement? Now, if you look at the next part, this moves right into the Holy Ghost anointing. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in each and every one of us. And with every divine appointment comes Holy Ghost unction. Each of us have that. It's an anointing to fill the task which God has given you. That's what Peter was using. It wasn't in his flesh. It wasn't in his eyes. It was the Holy Ghost inside of him that was able to speak to that person. The scripture does not say that Peter and John ran all over Jerusalem yanking up crippled people by the hand. But they did raise up that one. That ought to get you excited about the possibility that can be you. There's no reason that can be you. Well, I'm not Peter. No, and neither am I. That doesn't the Bible say that you have to, you'd have to be Peter. The Bible says, Paul even said, follow, follow me as I follow Christ. That's who you follow, and that same spirit and that same power dwells within you. The gifts are still for today. It says, it says, now back up a minute. We know from the text that the man was lame from his mother's womb. Before that day, they'd either flipped a coin to this man or simply ignored him. What was different on this particular day? And if you look down, it says, and fixing his eyes on the lame man, what John Peter said, and that's when he did. So he obviously felt the unction, the anointing of the Holy Ghost to speak to him. So, so let me just jump in here and as we move along here. I wanted to just jump in here and say this. Uh, really, when it's talking about fixing his eyes on the lame man, because like like it said, like she just mentioned, he wasn't, you know, Peter and John weren't running around yanking people out of uh, uh, wheelchairs or not even wheelchairs, the crippled that were laying down or <laughs> had a wheel. They didn't, didn't even have, they never had wheelchairs. But <laughs> That's not funny, but they didn't have wheelchairs. Sorry. Well, they had wooden, wooden funny, chairs, but, but anyway. They probably had something, but they had, okay. they had men. They carried them on slats. Like, exactly. Through, okay, down through. So okay. anyway, the point Move being on. is that they weren't running around doing that. Um, but they were walking around. They were on their way to to the temple at prayer hour, and they saw the man just like they walked past this man. He'd obviously been there many times, but the Bible says Peter and John fixing their eyes. They looked at him, and in other words, there divine moments. We must be sensitive sensitive enough to stop and look because there's something about looking somebody in the eyes that when your eyes engage that the Spirit of God can then minister to your heart and that you can begin to flow in that divine moment. Many times when we are not wanting to engage, we try to make no eye contact. We don't want to look at the person and we must be spirit led as far as that goes. But sometimes we need to look and see if the heart of compassion of Jesus will rise up on the inside of us to do something. So anyway, that's well, what it's I talking love, about. Like, what he says here, are you seeing people through the, through the eyes of Christ? God, give me that heart for the humanity to not look past them. Give me your heart. Jesus moved with compassion. He moved with compassion. I love, um, I know there's controversy over is um, the chosen authentic to scripture. I'm not here to debate that with you. But I love the point of on the chosen where the disciples are arguing and whatever. And Jesus was still out ministering. It was dark. He looked at them in their arguing and just, and they all got quiet and he just said, good night. And it was such a moment of truth. Obviously, this was a, you know, they were making a creative um, way of, of showing that scripture. 
But he was he had compassion on people that when they're arguing about who's the greatest, he's still out ministering to people because he loved them. He had compassion. So if it, if it comes back to the basic, the first things, we love because he first loved us. You can't love other people if you don't know the love of God for yourself. So go back to that foundation. I'm loved. I'm loved. The Father God loves me. You can't even begin to look at people with compassion and with love if you don't know the love of the Father. So Amen. Start, start there. So I wanted to say here, we're going to go over to the last page, to the last paragraph. And while you're there, I'm going to read that. But before I read it, I just wanted to say this, um, you know, divine appointments, look for them. So Peter and John, um, being led by the Spirit on their way to pray, are caught up in a divine moment. And the result, the end of it was that lame man received his miracle because they stopped and were sensitive to that divine moment. And that's that scripture. Uh, in fact, there's a song that's written, walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God in the name of Jesus Christ You're of Nazareth. Okay. Rise up and walk. Huh? So there's actually the song that was written from that scripture. So out of that divine moment, the miracle happened. Praise God. So that's what happens when we're sensitive to those divine moments of well, those good works that God prepared for us and beforehand. the last thing I want to say for you read that paragraph and we pray is think of the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, are you going to pass by people that might look different? Are you going to pass by people that might not be your color, your race, your age, your whatever brackets? Look for those divine appointments. Look for them. Ask the Lord, bring me divine appointments. It says, can you begin to imagine what it would be like if all Christians kept their divine appointments? Our world would be turned upside down. If we kept our divine appointments and began to see whose we are in Christ, who you are in Christ, and walked in that identity, our world would turn upside down. We will see revival. To start with, we, we would not be bored. Secondly, we would truly begin to be a people that would turn our, I, I didn't even know that said that. See, that's just, that's divine right there. I didn't know it said that. Turn our world upside down for Jesus. What if we were to begin to ask God for daily collisions with God-ordained assignments? Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm going to I'm going to continue to do that. God, give me a God-ordained assignment. Let's begin thank, each day thanking God for the divine appointments he has in store for us and ask him to open our eyes to them that we won't miss a single one. Amen. Hallelujah. So Father, in fact, on the end, it says, congratulations, you're one in a million. Uh, remember, I'm going to be emailing you your um, uh, assignment answers, so we'll get those to you. But let's go ahead and close out, and we'll open up uh, for those of you that want to unmute yourselves and ask any questions. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time that we can get together and be fed from your word, to be encouraged and edified, exhorted by your word. I thank you, Father, that... Um, uh, that the seed of your word is planted in us. Let faith come. Uh, let boldness come. Yes. Let every bit of fear be dispelled. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that uh, we remove all of the pressure that says, I can't. And you write to say, I can't. And God wants to tell you, son, you can't, but I can through yes, you. Amen. So when you say, I can't, you're in a great position to let him do it through you. God says, open up your mouth. I'll fill it, speak, and I'll use your mouth. And the Spirit of the Lord says, be sensitive to those divine moments, for I will lead you into them, and I will cause you to be as one who will plant and will water, and I will continue to be the God who brings the increase. So I bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for coming in on another week of our School of yeah, Ministry. Remember